Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Your pastor is so tall, I love hugging his belly button here. It's really good. <laughs> so, all right, what a great looking group of people. Yeah. I need you to turn to your neighbor and say, You are sitting next to a big shot. And I want you to turn to the other guy that you ignore and says, I think you're a big shot too. <laughs> we're going to have some fun today. Uh, we're going to challenge uh, some of your thinking. I think you're going to walk out of here more jacked up and ready to take on the world here. And so we're going to share a few things. I wanted to share with you the 317 steps of simplifying your life. <laughs> Let's turn to Leviticus chapter 1. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Some people are so serious here. I wanted to first of all just uh, introduce uh, my wife, my better half. Uh, she is one of the best Christians I've ever met on the face of the earth, and I get to be with her a lot, so that's saying a lot. But she is like fine wine. She just gets better and more beautiful as the days go on. Sandy Redman here, let's welcome her. Okay. You are beautiful. And speaking of beautiful, we uh, met with this couple last night, and they're like this GQ gorgeous couple here, the pastors of this church. Are you kidding me here? It's like I think I've seen them on a magazine cover. This is like the church that like you've got to be so good looking to be able to come in the doors here or something. Even their kids are above average and everything. I still got a little concern with that firstborn over there, though. It was so hilarious. He goes, Dad, did you, did you, uh, do you know this guy? <laughs> like, what if he's crazy? So she came up and says, my parents threw me under the bus. I said, I am crazy, you know. <laughs> so... Anyway, we're gonna get we're gonna get along just fine here. I do also want to recognize uh, Nick and Michelle Castellano. Uh, they're just awesome people. I get, I get emotional. Uh, Nick and I have had some travels, and we uh, we made some some very interesting adventures in the government housing of Queens, which is right near where he grew up in Brooklyn. I do feel safer with Nick. <laughs> Matter of fact, I get a little cocky. <laughs> Wouldn't you? <laughs> and then he has this voice like, God, I'm James Earl Jones. <laughs> it's like, how do you go that deep, man? <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, Nick is uh, probably the smartest guy I know that loves Jesus more deeply than about anybody I know. It just... Just love you, Nick. You and Michelle are, are awesome people here, so really glad to, to be here. Uh, I am, I'm really excited here in terms of what I'm going to share with you. What I want to do in a, in, a, in a few minutes is I want to stir up the leadership gift that God put within you. And uh, there's, a, there's a special VIP I wanted to introduce you to. They're going to change the world for the better. They're going to defy gravity. They're going to change negative situations into positive. They're going to bring abundance into places of scarcity. And that person's sitting right in your chair right now. The VIP I'm talking about is you. And I want to stir up, through this message today, I want to stir up the wealth creation capacities that you have as an individual, that the wiring God put on the inside of you. Is this okay? Do I, we're not, like, is this camera or something? Do I have to, like, stay within this little box or can I walk around? Okay. All right. Um, God wants you to change your world in a way that you bring abundance to scarcity. You bring hope to despairing situations. You bring healing to brokenness. I want us to talk about a, a different way of looking at adversities. Adversities. Has anybody, uh, has anybody faced a challenge? 
how, how, yeah, how are you this morning? How many are sitting next to your biggest challenge? No, no. <laughs> I saw those looks. <laughs> well, how many of y'all are like Pentecostal? Or you've, you've seen Pentecostals across the street? I'm going to prophesy. I'm going to prophesy something. Thus saith Tim, ye have faced challenges and ye shall face more challenges. Boom. <laughs> yeah, I think maybe your daughter was on to something here. <laughs> But how do you look at, think about a big challenge that you're facing right now. It may be financial. It may be relational, which means it's emotional. It may be a mental challenge. Think about a challenge right now that seems like it's slowing you down. It seems like you're, you're almost victimized by it. It, just, it seems bigger than you, but you know, in church and you're around other people, no, I'm bigger than that, but on the inside, you're, you're, maybe, you're, maybe you're a little afraid. Maybe, you're, maybe you, the, the thing you did that nobody knows about is, 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 is binding you with that shame, keeping you locked up. And we need all of you to come out and play for this church. We need to build this building. We need to buy this building. As a matter of fact, I'm going to challenge, how many are business owners? How many work? <laughs> how many are not going to answer any questions that I have? And you're proud of that fact. Okay, yeah, we always have two or three. But I want to, I want to, I'm not big into this, you know, some, God told me somebody's going to give me $100,000, and well, well, I'm okay with that, but, <laughs> but I want to give $1,000 to your building fund, but I'd like, I'd like to, us to get to that $300,000, we're at two eighty one, and I would love for you guys, and some of you guys, if you want to raise your hand, boom, guys, gals, want to raise your hand and match my $1,000, bucks? let us get, let's get this thing to, to $300,000, can we do that? Yeah. Anybody want to match me on that? Thousand bucks. You're a bunch of folks. How old are you? 32. 32, man. You're too young to be doing this. <laughs> this is awesome. Doggone. This is awesome. Deuteronomy 111. Quit staring at me. Look it up. <laughs> Anybody know what that says? Somebody say it? God is going to increase you a thousand times. And he's talking about a nation, but he's also talking about a big shot like you, 32 years old. So that's pretty awesome. So let's get this thing, let's get this uh, building built. Let's get it bought. Whatever we need to do, let's get there. And so what I want to do is I want to, I want to talk to this leadership gift. I want to talk to this wealth creation capacity because God wants to move you into a place where you're even more productive. And it has to do with your approach on things. So I, I, I want to teach you just a little bit, just shortly, I want to teach you about leadership. And I want to define leadership in a very simple way. You'll never forget it. Leadership is improving your looks. <laughs> leadership is improving your looks. Now, how many of you looked in the mirror today? What did you say? <laughs> You're awesome. Good. I just woke somebody up. Well, well he is uh, just calm down. I didn't take my medicine. <laughs> Sorry, you guys. So, so uh, a lot of times we look in the mirror in the morning, and sometimes what we say to ourselves is, is not so good. And I want to challenge you. If you had a friend that spoke to you the way you speak to yourself, would they still be your friend? Stop building a case against yourself. You're the answer to somebody's prayer. People are starving for your leadership gift to come out and play, to change situations. What I want to do is I want to talk to you about leadership is improving your looks, but it's not necessarily how you look in the mirror, but how are you looking at what you're looking at? 
I coach companies here. I've coached over 2,000 business owners in the last 10 years. We get huge results. And there's one guy that we're bringing them through what we call a growth plan, where we analyze the strengths and weaknesses of their business, and we get a three-year goal, and then we give them concrete steps of how to get there. And that's kind of what we do all day, every day. And we went through this process, and this guy was just so negative. He just, he, the way he was looking at his business was a place of scarcity, was a place of no opportunity. And he shut down, and he sat down on the inside. God wants you to stand up. He wants you to speak out. And after bringing him through this growth plan, he just had a new hope, and we began to implement this thing. And I remember it was in an April, and he worked through just going after it, following the plan that we set up. And in one month, he booked contracts that equaled the last entire year's worth of activity in one month. Just by changing his looks, how he was looking at what he was looking at, it, it, it completely changed the results in his life. And I want you to turn to 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15. It talks about a story in there about Elisha, the prophet. There's Elijah, J comes before S, Elisha. Elisha is the one that asked for the double anointing. And he was, he was telling the king of Israel what this king of Aram was, was doing, what his plans were, and it, they'd be thwarted. And they go, well, who's, who's the traitor? What, what, who's, who's the traitor in this whole process? He said, well, it's Elisha. He's telling you everything that you're doing. He's telling that to the king. He said, well, let's go after Elisha. And so they surround the city where Elisha and his servant are. And the servant woke up and looked over the, over the wall there. And there's all this army here. And he's like, <laughs> I'm associated with Elisha. You know, they're going to remove my body parts all over the place as well. I, you know, he started the way he looked at the opposition. He looked at the reality of the situation. It did not look good. And then what does it say in the scriptures there? In verse 16, well, I'll just read in verse 15. When the servant, the man of God, got up early the next morning, went outside, there were troops, horses, and chariots everywhere. Uh, sir, <coughs> sir, <laughs> what do we do now? <laughs> Have you ever asked that? <laughs> what do we do now in this situation? It says, the young man cried to Elijah. Elijah said, don't be afraid, for there are more on our side than on theirs. Then Elijah prayed the very prayer I'm praying over you today. What did he pray? He said, Lord, open his eyes and let him see. Improve his looks. Improve the way he's looking at what he's looking at. Things of shame, things of of guilt, things of hurt, things of betrayal. Sometimes they shut us down and we don't come out to play. And this is a church that's changing this community because the people in the church are changing the community. You've got to improve your looks. Albert Adler was a psychologist in the turn of the 1900s, one of the early psychologists. And he studied inferiority complex. It's very interesting. Have you all heard of Dr. Adler? Okay, some of you guys. All right, so he studied inferiority complex, and he found that those, he said, first of all, almost every human being suffers from some level of inferiority complex. He said, but there's two kinds of responses. There are those that live under, they live under the shadow of that inferiority and they serve it. Then there are those that defy that inferiority. They work so hard at overcoming it 
He created this, it's really an observation, he created this law, the law of overcoming weaknesses. It was, it was they worked so hard that they became strong in the very area where they felt they, they faced weakness. Their stumbling block became their stepping stone. And I like uh, what Dr. Mark Schoen wrote in uh, Your Survival Instinct. He wrote, the number one skill of the 21st century, the number one skill of the 21st century is... I'll share that when I come back, okay? How many are interested in hearing what that is? Y'all just staring at me. It's like, does anybody want to hear that? Okay, all right. The number one skill in the 21st century, he said, was learning to be comfortable in discomfort. When you change the world, people are inherently resistant to change. Some of you said it. And that's not really the truth. It's not really the truth, but we've made it the truth, so it becomes true. This is really, really important for you and how you're looking at that challenge in your life and how you're looking at your future. Your future is always bigger than your past. When your past is bigger than your future, there's something on you that shuts down. Your future is always bigger than your, than your past. I was born with, with a number of complications. By the way, I'm one of 11 children, good Catholic family, okay? My parents love sex or love kids or both. I don't know. I didn't just say that, did I? <laughs> sure. It's on the record. <laughs> was that you, Nick? <laughs> <laughs> okay, no blinding glass. No comprending. Lo siento. No sé, I can do it. I can't do it. Um, anyway, so I just lost my place. <laughs> so, anyways, I was born with a cleft palate. That's where your face doesn't come together. And there may be some doctors in your plastic surgeons. You've done some of that work. And, um, and there's a number of other complications, and my, so my parents ran me to, they're good Catholics, and ran me to the priest to be baptized before I died, because they didn't expect me to live through the week. And I, punchline here, I, I made it, okay? So, uh, just, I hate, hate to hate the spoiler alert here. But this man held me and looked at the deformity of my face and not coming together. And... There's many priests that really love Jesus, that walk with Jesus. I'm not downing the Catholic Church. There's a lot of believers in the Catholic Church that are just powerful men and women of God. But this guy, he looked at me and he, like he announced a curse. He said, this boy will never be a priest and he'll never be a public speaker. And it came out of his mouth, and my mother told me it was, like, it was like a curse that came over me. And this guy, six months later, declared himself to be an atheist. He, he, for whatever reason, he wasn't a good man, okay? But I still live under the power of that curse. I was looking at what I was looking at from a place of inadequacy, from a place of inferiority, from a place of serving the shame of how I was looking at what I was looking at. Do you all hear what I'm saying? Yeah. And when I was 16, the Lord spoke to me. And he said, I'm calling you to be my mouthpiece. He used that word mouthpiece. The very area of pain and shame and, and just terribly introverted. He said, I'm going to use that very area of pain to establish my glory in the earth. And I stand before you today in defiance of that curse. 
to the glory of God. Amen. How are you looking at what you're looking at? Are you conforming to this challenge? It says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Are you blending in? Are you forgetting who you are? Simba? <laughs> I don't know where that came from. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'm, just, I'm just saying here, sometimes we just forget who we are. And we start conforming to the very area that God wants us to change. I believe that the wiring of God on the inside of you is so strong that he's actually calling you to a place of lack. Amen. God's calling you to a place of poverty. Well, I rebuke that. Well, hold on. Put your shorts back on. Hold on just a minute. Let me finish my thought. God's calling you to a place of poverty so that you can bring his abundance there. He's calling you to a place of scarcity that you can bring solutions and hope into that place. God's causing you to become wealthy because you're not going to shut down and, and, and sit down and melt away and conform away. You're going to stand up in the wiring God's got on the inside of you. To defy the things the devil is trying to convince you to sit down and shut up. I'm telling you, God's doing a work within the people of this church. There's increase coming to you. There's increase coming to you. There's abundance coming to you. There's solutions coming to you. There's financial uh, breakthroughs coming to you. There's relational breakthroughs coming to you because you're changing the way you're looking at what you're looking at. I think about this time. I was uh, going to New York for a trade show. I was working at this software company, and we it was really a fun, fun thing. I, I had worked at PricewaterhouseCoopers for a while, and then I... Uh, uh, went to work for the software company. I joined the founder, and just he and I grew it to about 400 employees. We ended up selling it to Intuit, Quick and QuickBooks, those guys. So it was a big deal. But I was in the middle of uh, growing this company. I was going to New York for a trade show, and I was going through Chicago. And I remember, it's like you ever go through Chicago, and it's like all these hallways. <laughs> it's just like the whole airport is like going through all these long hallways. And I remember, like, everybody around me was walking just super fast, and it was almost like running. To, they're just in a hurry. To, and I remember I just was like, you know, I came out from Tulsa, Oklahoma, <laughs> Midwest. How y'all doing? <laughs> you know. And everybody's walking just real fast. And I remember I'm, like, looking around, and I start, I start walking faster <laughs> and faster. And I'm like, wow, well, I've got to get going here. I remember going up and down the hallway. I remember going down this hallway G, this gate, the, the gate G. And I remember I was walking. It was almost like I was sprinting. And I was right next to a business guy. And he was ahead of me. And I got ahead of him. And we're like almost racing. And I'm like, just as fast as I can. I ran as fast as I can. Just, just like walking so fast and, and just relentlessly going after it. I just had to hurry up. And I got to my gate. And I sat down and waited three hours. <laughs> That's called conforming to your world. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> it's like on Saturday Night Live, there's this uh, skit about the coach. One of my funniest comedians there is, he's like, hey, I've got three words to, you know, well, I've got this deep psychological issue, and I got, they're going on and on, and I just, hey, what, 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 we're good, we're good. I got three words. Stop it now! <laughs> so, so I want you guys, look at your life. What are you conforming to? It's usually the very thing that you're supposed to transform. 
requires a strength on the inside. God wants you to rise up. God wants you not to conform to this world, but he wants you to transform it. The way you're looking at what you're looking at is either serving you and the gift that God put on the inside of you, or it's, it's shutting it down and shutting it out, moving it out of the way. I want to share a real personal story. And this whole sermon title, if you wanted to call it that, is your adversity is your advantage. The thing that seems like it wants to shut you down is the very, st it's the stepping stone, not a stumbling block. It's, it's the very way you're going to get to where God's land of promise was. And it's not without getting you tough. It's not without getting you in shape. It's not without working a deep work within your heart, but you are well able to overcome. I'm asking you to stand up to that thing you've sat down on. I'm asking you to speak out when the world around you wants you to shut up and shut down. People are starving for your leadership to come out. They're starving for your wealth creation capacities to come out. When I was 15, I was traveling with my brother from Tulsa to 100 miles down in Oklahoma City to go to a drum and bugle corps concert that night. We're driving in a little Volkswagen. And all of a sudden, the, it's like the axle broke, and we careened into the, at the time, it was like a, a grassy uh, hill, median. And when we hit that median, the grassy median, the Volkswagen began to tumble. And it threw my brother and I out of the car, and we hit head first on the highway on the other side. He was killed instantly, and I was left to die. My parents got a call. Said, come down to Mercy Hospital. Your two sons were in an accident. One's not dead, and the other one's not expected to live through the night. Imagine getting a call like that. There were so many things that happened. One of, the, one of the things that happened was there was a nurse that came by and helped my brother Pat. And he, they tried to revive him, but the nurse stayed there until the highway patrol came and reported everything and just wasn't able to revive Pat. But there's another nurse that came by and found me and said that I had stopped breathing and my heart was not going, but she had revived me and cleared my throat and all that. We were never able to find that nurse. Never able to find that nurse. God has a plan for your life. That's way beyond what you may see right now. I was rushed to the hospital. The doctors said, hey, listen, my parents showed up, said, uh, Tim is probably not going to make it through the night. Just telling you right now. But if he makes it through the night, he's not going to come out the same person. He'll be like a vegetable, drooling for the rest of his life. Due to the nature of the fractured skull and the head injury, he's, he's not going to be right. And there's a number of other things that happened that, to that, but again, spoiler alert, I, <laughs> I made it. <laughs> But on a serious note, I was praying with my mom and some friends that had come over just to comfort her. By the way, I did come out of a coma 10 days later, but I had lost the ability to read and write. Going through school, I never even made a B with straight A's. Just never challenge. And here, I, I could remember that these symbols meant something but they were just jumbled around and I just just it just didn't make sense to me 
And my dad, every day, would just work with me, reading the Bible with me. And slowly but surely, it wasn't like this instant, you know, Superman coming out of the telephone booth. But I came to, and God had healed me. And sometimes my wife wonders if I've got that complete healing or not. No, no, I'm sorry. She's never said that. <laughs> I've done enough things to cause her to wonder, though. But during this time of prayer, it was like I had an open vision. And uh, it was amazing. And my mom, who was a prophet, could see things. <laughs> and she goes, Tim, you saw something. What did you see? Nothing, Mom. I, no, you, you saw something. What did you see? Tell us about it. So I told her the story of what I saw like in an open vision. It was as real as I'm looking at the pastor right now. And I described the scene of the accident, and my mom interrupted me and said, oh, I didn't know you were awake. That's exactly what it was like. I said, I'm just showing you this open vision. And I saw my brother lying in a pool of his blood, and I saw his spirit like leave him and there was an angel on either side of him and he went up to heaven and met Jesus and Jesus like had his arm around him and Jesus for whatever reason was really tall kind of like Nick and Pastor Ben <laughs> and when I saw that I also left my body and ascended to Jesus and as I began to approach, I wasn't aware of an angel on either side. There may have been, but I wasn't aware of that. I just saw Jesus. And it's like when I came close to him, he reached out his hand like this, and we grasped, grasped hands just like this. We're, we're just like this. And he began to speak to me, but he didn't open his mouth. He didn't move his lips. He began to speak to me with his eyes. Now, I didn't realize Psalm 32, 8 was there, where he guides us with his eyes. He communicates to us with his eyes. But when I looked into the eyes of Jesus, it was like looking down a well two miles deep. And out from the, from the, from the depths of that well, it was like wave after wave would come of liquid love that would just come out of his eyes and just completely capsize me. I was captivated in his love quite literally. And he began to speak to me and he said, Tim, he said, you can be here with me, you can be here with your brother, but my will is for you to go back and comfort your family and finish the work I've called you to do. And I looked around heaven. It was fascinating, folks. It was like there was light all around. It was like, it was like when I moved my, my arm through the air, my arm became more alive because every molecule just reflected the, the glory of God, the, the life of God. It was, it was amazing. And it was like when I saw, like over this hill, I saw the plants and the flowers. And it was like there was no shade because everything just like was emanating light. It was just the most fascinating thing I've ever seen. And I turned to Jesus and I said, no way, Jose. I didn't say that, but I did not say that to Jesus. I said, no, Jesus. Because I want to be here with you. I want to be here with my best friend, my brother. And he spoke it again. We, we had that same, we're still holding hands just like this. And he spoke to me again. He said, my will is for you to return to the earth. You can be here, but my will is for you to return to the earth. To comfort your family and finish the work I've called you to do. And again, I said, no. No, I want to be here. Then, still holding hands, he spoke 
the same thing a third time. You can be here, but my will is for you. Return to the earth to comfort your family and finish the work I've called you to do. And then he had me look at my dad and just a lot of people, <laughs> just my family, but just my brothers and sisters. They were crying for losing two sons and two brothers at the same time. And you guys are going to judge me on this, but I don't really care. <laughs> I looked at them, and I looked at where I was in heaven. I said, they'll get over it. <laughs> Isn't that horrible? And then Jesus, being the Jew that he is, knows how to close a sale. <laughs> I hope you guys don't take that wrong. Is this a politically correct environment here? <laughs> um, I'm sorry. I'm not really sorry. but <laughs> So, he turned me over. I saw my mama. There's nobody that loves you like your mama. Even husband and wife, there's a strong love there, but there's just... There's not a stronger love on the earth than a mama with her children. And I saw that she had cried until she had no more tears left. And her face was puffed up and was red and dark murks under her eyes. And she had just cried until she had no more tears. And I saw that her heart was broken. And again, we're still this. I look back. I said, okay, Jesus, I will. I will return to the earth to comfort my family and finish the work you've called me to do. So at that, he grabbed my wrist like this, let go of my hand, and pushed me around, and then pushed me back into my body. Your adversity is your advantage. The very thing that the devil meant to destroy you, to paralyze you, to slow you down, to distract you, to keep you from moving into the promised land that he's called you to. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Habakkuk 3.19, for the Lord is your strength. And he's making your feet like hind's feet so you can climb and gallop up your high mountain that God's got for you. It's not settling for second best. And we're not talking about inadequacy. You're not coming from a place of inadequacy. You're completing him right now. Amen. I want you to close your eyes for a moment. And I want you just to imagine Jesus walking up to you and putting his hand right on your shoulder. And I want you to imagine Jesus challenging you with the same. Comfort your family. And I want you to finish the work I've called you to do. It's going to take boldness. It's going to take confidence. It's going to take steps of faith and leaps of faith. It's going to take this body to support you. Stay plugged into this church. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for these gorgeous, beautiful people that you've called here at this time. Lord, I pray that they would hear your call for them to finish the work. Lord, I pray for an impartation today. I pray, Lord God, for... A, a new realm of confidence rising up in them. I pray, Lord God, that as you call them to finish the work that you called them to do, Lord, that there would be an equipping, that they are more than enough. Lord, I pray that you give them creative ideas and strategies and concepts and connections 
to finish the work and that you said that your very pathways drift with abundance and prosperity. I pray that there'd be a new level of prosperity in this church. I pray there'd be a new level of of confidence and boldness to make tough decisions to move forward, to expand their territory. Do this deep work in their hearts. In Jesus' name. And if you prayed that prayer, I want you to say with me, Amen. Amen. I'm going to have the pastor uh, wrap up the sermon here in just a few moments. But did y'all get something out of today? Are y'all walking out of here with a little bit more confidence? Maybe a challenge in how you're looking at what you're looking at? I'm not going to take a lot of time for this, but I do want to, I don't know if they have a, slide. Is Joel around? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I got some stuff that it's a, it's a whole school of leadership and a school of wealth creation that I combined together. And I have it all available as a, as a download. It's normally $842, but I'm going to sell it to you guys for $1,500. Uh, <laughs> if I can, uh, I've got, I've got it listed on the, um, the price tag as I think it's $197. If you guys, if you guys want that, um, we're going to knock even $100 off of that. We're going to get that whole, this whole thing for $97 if you want that. If you sign up for that, put your email that you can, I'm going to send that, give you the download code, and you'll be able to do that tonight or tomorrow morning. So this has got... Um, the power to create, which is really one of my life messages, and uh, the uh, school of wealth, the emotions of money, building confidence, having making an impact. We even have a marriage seminar that Sandy and I did that's really pretty good stuff. Um, it, it, it covers pretty much all aspects of it. It's really like a, a university or a class. If you guys want to get access to that, great. Um, I do have a handful of books, which is Power to Create Books. I've got some of these uh, um, sets here. And I think those are, I think I've got them. They're normally a couple hundred dollars, but I think I got them for $97. Why don't we do this? There's a handful of them if you guys want to actually have a DVD, which is a technology with the older people will remember that. Uh, but... If you want to get that, we're just going to make those available for 50 bucks. And if we run out, I can ship some more. But we'll just make that for 50 bucks, which is kind of my cost. But I just want to bless the church. And uh, you guys are awesome. Embrace your calling. And go for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, this is Pastor Ben Diaz. Thank you so much for watching our YouTube video. I hope it was a blessing to you. If it was, go ahead and give it a like and maybe share it with a friend. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can receive notifications when new videos come up or when we go live. Also, on the description below, you'll be able to find our social media pages, our website, and other resources that might be helpful for you. Have a good one.